No, 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 I'm gonna, I'm gonna, the girls are going to come up, come up right here. Okay. Guys, everybody want to get started? Go, go get them. <laughs> we didn't know what music to expect. <laughs> teaches us, the ultimate teacher, with what Christ has given us, this privilege and honor we give to others, we teach others, Amen. whether it's one or one thousand. I know Christ and God are smiling right now because they're dedicated, they're committed, they're loving, and they're ready they know their schedules, they're helping each other out, we're friends, and what greater thing is there in life than to love God and to love one another? And so it's a privilege for me to even be a tiny part of this and a small part of this. So I just want to uh, recognize them for this and in show of the church's appreciation for my personal appreciation of what they do. I just want to say thank you all. Because you didn't have to. But we're also grateful. And I know our children are grateful. For those of you who might not be able to read, I'm going to read someone's shirt. I'm going to read your shirt. Anybody's shirt? Can I, no, can I see the frame again, please? I am a teacher. Okay? With the heartbeat, okay? Look what happens to the heartbeat when it meets the cross. Boom, boom, boom. The life of Christ that he gives to us. The heartbeat starts when you hit that cross. I am a teacher. Where? Cross Point Wesleyan Church of the One. The cross. Someone's back, please, Brenda. My Lord and I, not just me, not just I, my oh. Lord and I, take a hand, <laughs> open a mind, touch a heart, inspire a soul, awaken a light, love a child. Okay. What a noble calling to be ready. We don't know when the hour is. When he'll return. I want to thank your teachers for just for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> 
Oh, I didn't know that. Good morning, everyone. Let's start with prayer. Father God, we thank you so much, Lord, for uh, you teaching us, Lord. And uh, it's very fitting for today when we think about teachers, Lord. We thank you, God, for uh, people you put in our lives to teach us about you. And Father, you are the ultimate teacher. You guide us and you direct us. You help us, Lord God. Father, we thank you for your wisdom, your insight, the Holy Spirit, how you lead us, God. Father, we ask that you bless this church. Um, we know Liz is in the hospital and some different people are very sick. Some people are on Zoom right now, Lord God. We ask that you touch people's bodies in a great way, Lord God. We ask for healing upon this church, Lord God. Yeah. And we thank you for your hand upon us, God, how you walk with us during difficult times. And Father, we're here to praise you today, Lord God. We thank you, God, so much. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. A couple quick announcements. Um, tomorrow night, we'll be doing a book study at 6 o'clock. And we are doing a study on perfect love. And what we do is we read the book, and the board is also reading this book at the same time. And we're able to break bread at 6 o'clock and 7 o'clock, we do a study on the book. On Wednesday night, we have Bible study, and that's at 6 o'clock live and on Zoom. Uh, we're doing a great study in Samuel. So don't miss that, because we're really tearing apart God's Word and really growing in that Word. I'm going to put this down so that they can see us on the film. Um, thank you to everybody who did yard sale yesterday. We met a lot of people in our community. We raised some money. In fact, for Ukraine, we still have the jar in the back. If you want to take a baked good, Sharon went ahead and worked and worked and worked and baked, and Vicki did. And so if you want to donate a little bit more to Ukraine fund, please go ahead and do that. And Vicki did a great job with the yard sale. If you want to donate to that, please give money to Vicki for the local charities and uh, Haiti, we talked about, is, is who we're going to give overseas, and also some to, uh, we think about Mr. Allen's uh, charity that he does in Thailand. So there's different missionary work being done all around the world. Wednesday night, I will show you a clip of one of our missionaries, too. We want to show that um, basically on a Wednesday night. So if you want to see it, come out on Wednesday night and see that. Miss Irma, can we give Miss Irma a round of applause? <laughs> she is going to lead us in a great singing today. So let us rise if you're able to worship the Lord. Also, just for yesterday, it just wasn't me. It was Skip and Pastor and Pat and Sharon and Gary and Chuck. Awesome. Thanks for Everybody knows.
give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken.
Father God, we thank you so much how you have blessed us, God, how you have abundantly taken care of us with food in our mouths, a place to sleep for, food, and also, too, um, we think about clothes on our backs. You are our giver. You are good to us, God. Father, you give us your spirit, your presence, God. Today, I ask that you bless this all for me, to multiply, God, yes, and give to the giver and give it to those who cannot give. We thank you for this church, and we thank you for the men and women, Lord God, who you use to serve. Yes. We, it's, we count as a privilege to, uh, to serve you, Father. Yes, so In Jesus' is. name, amen. 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 Thank you, John. I was angry at God for letting this happen. My me focused life was shattered. I was afraid I was going crazy. Exhausted from trying to hold it all in and act like I was okay. I felt completely lost. Resentful that life was going on like normal for everyone else. I was lonely. Scared of my new normal. I had an intense longing for things as they used to be. <laughs> was this pain ever going to go away? I lost my husband suddenly and we had three young children. I lost four family members in six weeks. A miscarriage halfway through my pregnancy. Several friends in high school and more recently my father's new heart failure. And I got the phone call that my mom had taken her life. And I just... Uh, We'll never forget that moment uh, in time everything just froze. I really felt like things were in control and I had a good handle on everything. I quickly learned that I wasn't in control of anything. My head was in a fog. I didn't know where I was. It was so completely opposite of everything that I knew and trusted and loved about God. I couldn't find that hope. I didn't feel that closeness with the Lord. Why have you chosen to take my brother who loved you so much. When I started the Grief Recovery Program, I really didn't want to be there. I didn't want to be the girl who needed to go to something like this, and I didn't want to share my pain and cry in front of others. It had been 13 years at that point uh, since I had lost my mom, and I felt like I was going to walk into a room, and there were going to be people there who had a really fresh loss, and I would be taking something away by walking in with my old loss. When I got there, though, I was made to feel so at ease that I could express myself and get it off my chest. That what I experienced was common with other people. And man, it was freeing. It was so freeing to find out that I wasn't just crazy. I could put that burden down for a while. I could be honest. Maybe let a little of the crazy out. <laughs> the freedom to, to forgive my parents for, for not being around. As silly as that sounds. I used to think of time as being meaningless. And time doesn't be meaningless. Grief never really goes away, but it can be turned into something different. And that something different can be hope. Because now I have tools to work through it and to go to the Lord immediately and lean on Him. Lamentations 3.32 says that though He brings grief, He will also show compassion. And yeah, I was, I was grieving and it wasn't fun, but at the same time, he was there and he was sitting with me in my pain and he had a community around me. Feelings of loss that bring us together and help us to support each other in ways that bring us outside of our situations to a greater understanding of the bigger picture of what God's trying to do. Jesus tells us there's going to be many troubles in this world, but to take heart, I have overcome the world. I can take the next step. I can do the next thing. And I was relying on myself, the power of one. Instead of relying on the power of the one, that I could find true recovery. Through grief recovery, I've found that it's not so much about death, but it's about life. This is why we do Grief Sharing this Church. We know this past year, a lot of people have had a lot of losses. Um, some of you have been attending this church and who moved away just had a, a breakdown because they said, you know, Susan, I didn't realize that grief was this bad. Grief is hard, but this is something that God gives us hope. He walks with us. We are not alone. Amen. And this is why we want people to be stronger and to be able to know that you're not alone. And that's why this church does grief share. So today we're going to start again. 
grief share. So be praying for people. And this is for everybody. We all have lost in our lives. So this is about when you have a lost loved one who's passed and you need healing. And that's what you all need. Because we all need him. Yes. So we're going to have Miss Irma come up and sing again. So we can please rise. Yes, I'm Irma. Before we sing the next song, I just want to remind everyone that uh, there is the Cornerstone Pregnancy Center's annual uh, Baby Bible Boomerang. But I will not have Baby Bibles with me, but I will have your little card with uh, this fluorescent. You'll put your name on it, leave your name on a list if you'd be willing to give towards Cornerstone. Um, and I have it in a tiny little snowman uh, lunchbox. So uh, <laughs> that's, how I, that's how I take care of that kind of business. But um, it helps um, moms-to-be, those who have an unexpected pregnancy and need help before they abort that child and leave themselves empty because of it. They can earn points towards, uh, they can take classes earn things um, as they go, as they learn to be moms and keep their babies. So there was a site there in Salem, also in um, Bridgeton. So if you can, just see me later on, just whatever, whatever. And it runs for about a month. I'm, just, I'm not quick enough to have it all ready yet, but uh, through at least, I think, till the end of June. So please see me about that, if you will, and I surely would appreciate it, and I know that they will. And for those, when I was away um, in North Carolina because of a passing of my brother-in-law, um, there were people who went to Cornerstone and helped out by putting labels on their bottles. And I thank all of you for doing that, especially since I was many miles away. So I'm glad you kept it going, and I appreciate that. Thank you so much.
Father, you lead your children. You help us to have discernment. You help us when things are going wrong. You show us which way to go. You give us hope in the midst of trials. You pick us up when we're feeling down. Father, I thank you. I see Cheryl here, and she's been having a hard week, Lord God. I thank you. I see how you have touched her. I see Miss Edie and many different people, Lord God. To hear the baby, Lord God. I thank you so much for life, God. And Father, you bring life to us. You renew us. You restore us, God. And Father, today I just ask for you, for you to be heard, not me. Father, I ask you to take over this message, Lord God. Father, I thank you for your presence here today, Lord God. I thank you for us. We sing and we worship you, God. We know that you alone are Lord. And we praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. What makes a good teacher? Think about your favorite teacher. Everyone in this room has had a teacher who you just love. When you came into school, you were actually happy to hear them. Or maybe you went to a technical school and somebody just showed you some insight, but they had compassion and they taught you because they loved to teach and they connected with you. You know, some of it's a first grade teacher or somebody in college or high school, coach maybe. Somebody who's taught you stuff. I remember I used to have these beehive Sunday school teachers. <laughs> Miss Yost, she had hair this tall, but she just loved Jesus. And she taught, and when she taught, you were just like enveloped. You're like, oh my goodness, listen to her words. I can't wait to what the next thing that comes out of her mouth. And she showed love and grace. And I thought, what a wonderful woman this is. When you look at Indeed.com, it says there's eight qualities in a teacher. Listen to this. Effective goal setting, a clear communication, acting as a role model, adaptability and flexibility, preparation. Do you know to be a teacher and you're teaching in high school or elementary for hours at night, you're correcting papers. You know, you're planning that lesson. You're studying. I know Gary's son is a music teacher. And it takes hours upon hours worth of time. And people say they have the summers off, but they really don't because they're actually planning their lesson plan for the year. They are working so hard. You know, remember, we all just went through COVID. How many times parents and grandparents had to teach your kids on Zoom? You have a full new respect for teachers now. Hey. You know, all the work that they put in and to keep that kid focused, that takes a lot of work. Amen. It also says that they have self-reflection, a long love of learning. You know, teachers also learn all the time. They're reading, they're studying. And they also promote where you just love to learn. 
It's great when you walk in and someone wants to teach. You know, I loved it that you saw this morning and different ones of you here teach and to teach someone. You know, once you really study a Bible lesson, you know it. You have read it, you have read it again, you have come up with a lesson plan. You know, God first feeds you before you feed other people. <laughs> and so you know it like the back of your hand after the week and you're ready for those kids to come downstairs. The best teacher in the world was Jesus now. Look how Jesus taught people. He had a teaching style different than everybody else. He used every opportunity to teach someone. He used water, he used seeds, he used soil. When anybody came across him, he was teaching them. He taught people when they were in the midst of trials. He gave them hope. He showed them courage. He talked to them about how the Old Testament reflects the New Testament, that he was there as the New Testament. How God had a plan in life. He taught the masses, and then he taught one-on-one. -on -one. He would use those parables to use regular things so people could be able to teach it to other people. And then he got the disciples alone and he went deeper in teaching and deeper in understanding the Word of God. Wouldn't it have been amazing to hear how he spoke to the Pharisees? He knew how to get to their hearts and how they needed to change. And he lovingly told the truth. That's a big thing. He told the truth in love. Isn't it nice when someone tells you the truth and they tell it to you in love? You know, sometimes I know I was raised down south, so we're very honest people. I remember I used to have a, uh, a woman teacher when I went to nursing school and she would be yelling at you, smiling at the same time. You know, she'd be taking you out, but she would smile. <laughs> and you're like, really? I know I'm being yelled at. You know? <laughs> but she just had that subtle thing about it. You also think about Jesus teaching at the Passover. When he took that cup. And he taught that this is a new covenant of my blood. We think about what the cross means. You know, this means death. But we look at it as life, because that's what Jesus did. He changed the old me to a new me, because he died on that cross. How he changed the world, and he is still teaching us today. Every time we open up that book, it's a living book. It's amazing what we learn in the Bible. Anytime you're feeling lonely, discouraged, frustrated, open up that book. Turn off that TV set and just open up that book and read the Word of God. Because God wants to speak to you. He wants to grow you. He wants to show you in a brand new way. Nicodemus went to Jesus in the middle of the night. This is in John 3, verse 2. It said, This man came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. <laughs> Jesus responded and said to him, Truly, truly, I tell you, I say to you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The number one thing that Jesus taught us about was the kingdom of God. That future, that hope. Yeah. You know, to have it now and to have it in the future. Yeah. God's kingdom, to know you're loved. That he's carrying you and leading you. That you are not alone. That God loves you. Amen. We're going to be in James 3. Go to James 3 verse 1. Do not become teachers in large numbers, my brothers, since you know that you who are teachers will incur a stricter judgment. God has given warning here in the book of James that teachers will be judged. The teachers need to make sure what they teach is the truth. You know, people can twist this Bible to say anything. you got to teach what God is showing you. you got to teach God's word and don't go ahead and twist it. That's what the Pharisees did. They taught legalism. They taught a bunch of rules. They said, do it this way. And they put heavy yokes, heavy burdens on the people that were not God. And it's amazing, that's when Jesus came, was to break those yokes that the Pharisees were putting on people. Because it was not of God. Because God was saying,
saying about love. James goes on to tell us why many should not be teachers. <clears throat> For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to reign in the whole body as well. Look, when you look at that verse, it says we. That means James was talking about himself. We all have stumbled. We all have fallen. How many times have you put your foot in your mouth? How many times have you made a promise? You're like, why did I say that? I have a great way sometimes of talking to Gary. And what he's done is, how did I get four jobs? I don't know how you did that to me, but I agreed to them all. <laughs> but the thing is, is watch what we say. Because our mouths can bring destruction. Our mouths can crush a spirit. You know, in fact, it talks about in the Bible about fathers. Not to cut your children down so much, but to encourage them. You know, isn't it neat when you've had that fatherly figure in your life who's encouraged you, who shows you how to do something without cutting you down and belittling you, allows you to make mistakes, but to grow and to teach you. I can imagine Jesus as a carpenter and Joseph, his father, and how they're putting things together and working together. You see, when someone teaches you, you want to learn more. James gives an example of a bit in a horse's mouth. It says this, it's a piece of metal that fits inside a horse's mouth and it rests between the ins incisors and, and basically your back molar, okay? Where there's no teeth there. So they put this piece of metal in a horse's mouth and the ideal is to be able to pull on this piece of metal to guide the horse. When you're riding a horse, it makes you either go to the right when you pull it, the reins, or the left. So the whole, whole piece fits together. And when you want to stop the horse, you pull back on the reins. So it all works together. This little piece of bit moves this big horse. I don't know if you've ever seen Carlos horses. They're like Clydesdale. They're these huge horses. But think about this little piece being able to direct this horse. It sounds very painful, doesn't it? Would you like that in your mouth? I wouldn't like that in mine. Then James goes on to talk about people in a ship. You know, if you've ever kayaked and you go ahead and you uh, kayak or you go ahead and use a canoe, you have oars and you go ahead and you get in the boat. Well, if you keep on doing this, you'll go around in circles over and over again. You gotta be able to paddle on both sides. And if there's one more, if, if there's one, more than one person in that little boat, you can constantly go in circles if you don't work together. Remember the old Viking ships in the old Viking movies where everybody had the oars and stuff like that? But they had one main man telling them how to go ahead and move those oars. You have to go in the right direction. So they came up with a rudder, and a rudder is able to go in the back of the ship and help from the steering columns to steer that ship to the right or the left. It's that little piece of wood or metal that helped direct that whole big ship. That's amazing, isn't it? That little thing. So you think about the rudder and the bit of horse's mouth. Now think about our own mouth. We all have a tongue. It's a muscular organ. But if it's not reined in, it can do a lot of damage. It can hurt a lot of people. It's a muscle. It's strong. You know, we need our tongues to eat, to chew, to be able to swallow and to speak. Imagine if you didn't have a tongue. Wouldn't that be hard? Yes. But how we use our tongues matter. It says this in 1 Peter. For who, whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongues from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. You see, our tongues can be used to do a good job and say, that a boy. It can use to encourage. It can use to approve people. You know, it's like getting an A on your report card when people say, you did a good job. But also, too, it says this in Ephesians 4. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful in building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Watch what you're saying. Don't let bad things come out of here. 
Because bad things can come out of here in a heart. And we're to build people up for what they need. Not just what we want to say to people, but what they need. How to encourage. Remember the words of some of your grandmoms or your pop-ups. How they encouraged you. How they went ahead and gave you life. Those words were powerful. But what benefits the listener? Think, would you want to be spoken to this way when you talk to someone? Am I speaking words of life into someone? Or am I cutting them down? You know, they've said about kids that sometimes the first 11 minutes is always negative between a parent and a child. We have to be very careful and switch that up. That's too much negativity. We have to give them life. We have to encourage them to go on. I remember I had a teacher who worked in the Philadelphia school system. And she says, I have second graders, Susan, who have given up. Isn't that bad when a seven-year-old gives up on school? I don't know how to change that. But I tell you what, thank God for the good teachers who try. Who keep on trying to help kids learn. You know, you know, if you don't know the basics in elementary, how do you do middle school? How do you do high school? How do you do college? Those first formative years are really important. It's really important to grow them and encourage them. And unfortunately, not everybody has had that. Not everybody's had a teacher who's taken them under their wing and have taught them the basics that they need to know. It's amazing what we need to teach our children. But you know what, too? Sometimes silence is the most important thing we can do. When you don't know something about something, for lack of a better word, shut up. You know, when you hear the experts speaking, listen to them. Sometimes I have people who are answering me questions, and I'm, I'm trying to listen to the professional. you got to listen. It says this in Proverbs. Sin is not ended by multiplying words, but the prudent hold their tongue. We used to have Mr. Sam in our other church, and he was designing buildings. And we were in a board meeting, and he had his little graphs and his little diagrams and everything else. And I'm thinking, Susan, be quiet, because this man knows so much more than you do. Listen to him. Learn from him, because he's teaching us right now. Sometimes we talk way too much. I know, too, I was, uh, went to a seminar one time about love and respect about respecting a man and they say women talk way too much sometimes we need to just listen and if you're quiet enough a man will talk to you but you got to be quiet we got to listen because eventually they will unfold what they've done and i use this with my son the more i was quiet the more he would talk one woman went on a journey with her son and she said she decided not to say one word and after the trip he said i love that time with you mom they didn't say a word. They were just in the car together. And sometimes men just need a little bit more quiet than women need. They need to have that quiet time to go out and go ahead and pound some nails or to go ahead and work on the lawnmowers. They need that time to just be alone. So you've got to give them that time so that way they can come in and talk. And they've got to feel safe in a safe environment to be able to share their souls. Because sometimes, unfortunately, and I'm not killing any woman here, we overtalk them, and we need to listen to them, because they want to share their hearts. What was really neat, I know, when my husband died, it was really great to hear another man talk, because I missed hearing another man talk. And so it was really cool. One time, I remember we were doing hot dogs, and we were out in camp, and it was so cold. And this man came up to me and said, Susan, you're freezing. And I'm thinking, yes, I am. And he took a piece of cardboard, and he's like, stay on this cardboard. And I'm thinking, that makes so much more sense. I'm not standing on the ground and it's shielding me from freezing. But I listened to him and I did that and it made a difference. You see, people do want to help you out, but you got to listen to them. You got to let them speak. <clears throat> Go on, we think about gossip. Do you know they gossiped about Jesus? They called Jesus a glutton and a drunkard. Think about people who've gossiped about you. It's not good when people gossip, is it? Amen. You know? James goes ahead and he says, think about your tongue as like a spark. 
So think about a fire. Think about an electrical fire happening in a building. Not this one, Lord. But think about this. The disaster of our com says this. A two-story building. In 30 seconds, the fire starts and it rapidly grows. And then it spreads, the smoke starts happening. In a minute and 35 seconds, the temperature in the room raises to 190 degrees. And it rapidly, the smoke detectors go off. In two minutes and 30 seconds, the temperature in the room is 400 degrees. The smoke starts pouring into the other parts of the, the, of the house. In three minutes, the temperature down the room is 500 degrees Fahrenheit, and no human being can survive that heat. In three minutes and 20 seconds, it's incredibly challenging to be able to exit the room. You need to have another exit. And then it's called the flashover at three minutes and 43 seconds that the room where the fire originally started is now 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. That room, everything in the room has ignited and caught on fire. At four minutes and 33 seconds, the flames had engulfed the whole home, exterior, or rescue is no longer possible. This could mean life or death, what you make decisions in a couple minutes. When that fire starts, do you have an exit plan? Do you have a way out? Because that fire can kill you. That smoke can kill you. If you ever have somebody who has had a fire, take them to the emergency room. Because a lot of people, too, die under smoke inhalation, and they don't realize it. I had a girlfriend that they discharged within 15 minutes, her husband, and he died that night because the smoke was still in his lungs. But think about that spark. That spark was what ignited the whole building to call on flame. James says, our tongue can be that spark. Our tongues can tear people down in a minute. In fact, when you think about our tongues, think about what we write in our words. Now today with the internet and Facebook and everything else, an email can be flashed around quicker than that house caught on fire. An email or Facebook can destroy a person's reputation. It can hurt them so badly in just seconds. We have to be careful what we write. You know, if you're angry, stop and pray before you write that email. Because not everybody thinks when they write stuff, they don't have emotion into it, but you could take it the wrong way. But take and read it again. Even wait till the next day to respond. If you think, wait a minute, I'm really angry at this email. Just stop and pray about it. You know, don't get into those fights on Facebook because those are ugly. They don't honor God. It says this in Proverbs 26, 20. Without wood, a fire goes out. Without gossip, a quarrel dies down. You know, we can either stomp out the fire or we can throw gas on it. We can make it a flame in minutes. It says this in Ministries 127. During World War II, the United States government became concerned that a number of German spies were operating in America, sending information back to Germany regarding Allied war planes and special troops and ship movements. To keep them from impacting the war efforts, the Office of War Information launched a national campaign along with a slogan, Loose Lips, Sink Ships. It was a solemn warning to people to not repeat information that could be damaging or even deadly if it fell into the wrong hands. In the same way, the words of God is a warning to us about the dangers of gossip. Repeating stories has a way of dividing the body of Christ. Gossip is able to separate even the closest of friends. One of the seven sins on the list of particular abominations to God is this in Proverbs 6.19. He that soweth discord among brethren. You know, in the body of Christ, we need to honor each other with our words, with our language. Sometimes I might go ahead and correct some people when I realize that you might be teasing too much and realize we're out in public and people may not understand you're teasing. You know, we have to be careful what our words say. Has anybody ever gossiped about you? Remember high school? Those chatty girls? You know? Pray for your teenagers, because high school is not easy. You know, some people can be just mean and ugly. It's not easy to have a boy or a girl in high school. It says this, 
Jesus says this, are you still so dull? Jesus asks, don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then goes out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth, the person's mouth, comes from the heart. They defile them, for out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. That's from Matthew 15. James talks about man has been able to tame the wildest creatures. I think of SeaWorld. Why would anybody want to go in and swim with a killer whale? It makes no sense to me. But people do that, don't they? People go into a lion's den and go ahead and try to tame a lion. I would love to paint a, paint a lion, but I won't go in there because he could take my arm off. But it says that man can tame all these wild animals, but we cannot tame the tongue because the tongue is hard to tame. Let's go to Numbers 12 if you have your Bible. We're going to do 1 through 16. There's a story in Numbers. And Miriam and Aaron, they were Moses' brother and sister. They rebelled against Moses on account of a Cushonite woman that he had married. They asked, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he always also spoken through us? But the Lord heard it. You see, Moses married Zephara, and it's in the Old Testament. And we don't know if this was Zephara or whether or not he got married again, if Zephara died or what happened. But anyway, she was a Cushonite, which she might be from Ethiopia. So her skin may have been a different color. But this is the only place in the Bible that talks about this other woman that Moses married. So here his sister and his brother start ditching his wife. They start talking smack about his wife. That's not good, is it? Instead of supporting their brother and loving him and honoring him as leader of the whole Israelite area, they are talking bad about their brother. What does this do in leadership? Here, Aaron and Miriam were in leadership. God had given them the gift of prophecy. You know, you heard Miriam after they crossed the Red Sea. She's praising God. Aaron was asked by God to help be the spokesman for Moses when he went to Pharaoh to set the Israelites free. So they were supposed to work together. But here they're talking about their brother. And it says these words, but the Lord heard it. Think God hears every word we say. God hears what we say. That's an important thing to remember before you say it. You know, when we say the word holy, we're talking about God. Don't put holy with anything else but God. I remember seeing the Ten Commandments when I was in um, Bermuda, and it talked about honoring God's word, that God is holy. So when we say his name, his name is holy. You know, and even those slurs, you know, be, G's to me is a form of Jesus. Be careful what you say, how you speak about the Lord. It's the Lord's name. Anyway, going back to this. Now the man Moses was a very humble man more than any other person on earth. Moses was powerful, but he was loving. Many times the Israelites messed up. Do you know what Moses did? He fell on his face and he prayed for these people. They attacked him over and over again, and he fell on his face and he prayed for those people. Thinking, I know who God is. God's gonna wipe you out. And he prayed for them. This is one thing we can do for our enemies is we can pray for them. When people ridicule you or make fun of you, pray for them. You see, you know God. You are saved. They're lost. They don't know the Lord. They aren't saved. So sometimes when you handle a situation and it's ugly, they are seeing how you're handling it. They're seeing how loving you are. And that's a testimony to Christ. Say, God, help me to love this person even though that they're rude and they're mean to me. Let me not take them out. Let me love them even though they hurt me. So anyway, all of a sudden the Lord told Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, the three of you are to come out to the tent meeting. So the three of them go out. God knows what they said. And then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud 
And he stood at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And he summons Aaron and Miriam. So both of them went forward. Wouldn't you be scared if God called you out to the tent of meeting because you just cut down your sister-in-law? Think about this. And God is calling them out. So Miriam and Aaron are called out in front of God. Then he told the two of them, pay attention to what I have to say. When there is a prophet among you, won't the Lord reveal himself in a vision? Won't I speak with him in a dream? But that's not what it is with my servant Moses, since he has been entrusted with my entire household. Moses had control and was the leader of all these two million people. All right. God had entrusted Moses and God had put Moses in command. Be careful how you talk about God's servant. It is not good. I've heard some people take a pastor out to lunch. And that means that they talk about them the whole time and he's not there. Don't do that. Believe me, you know me. If you have something to say to me, you say it to me. Okay? Because I will talk to you. You might have to go in that little room. But anyway. <laughs> Alright, where was I? Sorry. <laughs> but that is not how it is with my servant Moses. Since he has been entrusted with my entire household. I speak to him in audible. Audible. Some of you wonder when our God spoke audible, audible, and in visions, not in mysteries. If he can gaze at the image of the Lord, why aren't you afraid to speak against my servant Moses? They have attacked the servant. Because the Lord was very angry with them, he left. But when the cloud ascended from the tent, Miriam had become leprosy. As white as snow, Aaron turned towards Miriam and she had leprosy. Listen to this. Here's what Aaron does. Aaron begs Moses, I pray my Lord, please do not hold this sin against us. He's confessing. Since we've acted foolishly and sinned in doing so, he is begging Moses to help. Please don't let her be like one of the living dead who is born with a congenital skin disease. He's begging Moses, look, your sister looks dead. She's dying. She's going to be exiled from us. And she's got a disease now because of her mouth and my mouth. God forgive us for our mouth. So Moses prayed to the Lord. Oh, Lord, please heal her. Look how Moses is. Moses is interceding even though they criticized him. Moses is on his knees and he's begging God to touch this woman. Again, this is why you pray for your family who is lost, who are lost. But the Lord told Moses, if her father had merely spit in her face, wouldn't she be humiliated? She is to be placed in isolation for seven days. After that, she is to be brought in. So Miriam was isolated outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not tra travel until Miriam was brought in. After that, the people traveled from Hazarath, Roth, and encamped in the wilderness of Haran. For seven days, all these 2,000 people plus had to wait for Mary. Had to wait for Mary to be healed and be able to come back to the congregation. How humbling it had to be for Mary to walk back in. But it also was a good example for the rest of the congregation, the rest of the people, to realize that Moses was God's man. And they needed to respect Moses. You see, our words can be poison. Remember what James said. To be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to be angry. Stop and think before we speak. How are our tongues being used? Our words sort of give praises to God. We just sang praises to God. Listen to this verse in James 3. We're back there. Verse 9. With it. We will bless our Lord and Father, and with it we will curse people who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes forth blessings and curses, my brothers and sisters. These things should not be this way. You see, we can't praise God and then go yell at Skip. We have to think, Skip, God made Skip. 
I need to honor Skip because he's made in the image of God. He's a human being that God made. And I've got a love on Skip because I do love Skip. Okay? But also, too, if I yell at him and I treat him badly, it's not good. So think about our families. What does God want us to do? You see, God goes ahead and he plants a seed. And he makes a tree grow up and apples come out. Oranges do not. God goes ahead and he takes salt water for a special reason to have salt water. And then he has fresh springs that we can drink. But they don't get mixed. It's either one or the other. Either I'm a blessing to God or I'm a person. And that's not good. God wants us to reflect his image. Remember last week we talked about works. This week this is about our words. It's what we say and how we say them. It says this in verse 13. Who among you is wise and understanding? That means who among you are teachers? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in gentleness of wisdom. You see, just because you know something doesn't mean I attack somebody with. Jesus was always humble. He was always kind. He was always loving. Yes, he was firm, because there's a time to be firm too. But he told the truth in love. He always did that. Moses, being a godly man, humbled himself, and he was gentle. Do you know you learn when people encourage you? You are to teach the other generation. They need to know about God more than anything else. We need to pray for this church for children. We ask to God to multiply our teenagers and we need to invite our kids to church and our grandkids they need to hear this word this is more important than anything they learn in a capitalist book this is wisdom from God this is important what we know and what do we teach but you cannot beat somebody over the stick and think that they're gonna learn baseball you know they got to get in there and they got to strike out about nine times till you say that a boy and you go on you see, God does that when it's our walk. Because we all fall and come short when it comes to our words. We have all disgraced God one time or another, haven't we? But God wants us to turn the other cheek, even when someone speaks bad to us. And that's where God's Spirit comes in. It helps us grow. It says this in verse 14 in James 3. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. You see, jealousy is when I see somebody has something and I want it and I start hating them for it. That's what Marion did and Aaron did. Self-ambition is when I want to make myself better than somebody else. Arrogance is refusing to listen to advice, refusing to be teachable when someone's trying to help you and teach you. Don't think better of yourself because that's pride. That's narcissistic. God doesn't want that. You see, Satan is a liar. He wants to plant those weeds in our lives. But God wants us to grow in spirit and truth. His truth is golden. His word is life and not death. Satan wants to destroy and cut down as God's word. But God's like, no, I want you to be refreshed by it. I want you to know more. I want to give you wisdom. You see, Miriam had rotten fruit for what her mouth was saying. God wants us to be shining apples. It says this. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. Satan causes confusion. He wants you to be upset. He wants you to be mad. He wants somebody at church to say something wrong to you and not for you to come back. And he does that all the time. You've got to be the bigger person and realize, wait a minute, I can't let these words hurt me. You know? My dad and mom showed us Bambi. And we always had thoughtful. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. You know, my parents kept on saying that. Watch what you say. Here's what John Wesley said to a woman. A woman once shared with John Wesley that she believed her God-given talent was the gift of speaking her mind. Wesley told her that that was a talent God would not mind her bearing in the ground. Just because you think it doesn't mean it comes out of your mouth. God gives us this gift to his children. He gives good gifts. Here's what he gives us in verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure and holy. It's free from sin. The peace-loving freedom, the gentle, reasonable, full of grace, and good fruits 
impartial, free of hypocrisy. What God tells you is the truth and not a lie. And the fruits of righteousness is shown in peace by those who make peace. God wants you to be a peacemaker, not a destroyer, not to have basically unpeace in your life. You know, it's always hard to struggle with people sometimes. But the most powerful thing that you could do is to pray for that person. God, help me deal with that person that's getting under my skin. Help me keep peace. Maybe don't correct Gary when he's driving on the wrong side of the highway. Just let him drive for a little bit. <laughs> James 1 says this, If anyone thinks himself to be religious, yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this person's religious is worthless. You know, we have to bridle our tongues. Each one of us today are to be a model to other people. Do you know you may be, as people say, the only Bible people read? Your neighbor knows you went to church this morning. Your neighbor sees what you do. They don't need to hear foul music coming out of your house or foul language. They need to see grace and they need to see love. God wants us to live in peace with everyone and to be that fruit of the Spirit. So these are some takeaways. Think about it. Our speech is to build other people up. Sometimes silence is the most prudent thing. Spreading words can move quickly. Stop the gossip before it starts. Satan uses the tongue for evil. The Spirit of God is wisdom and pure and is peace and gentle bearing good fruit. Father God, we thank you for today. Father, we pray too, if anybody in this room does not know you, Jesus, is through words, what you did on that cross, you died for us. Father, we ask right now, if anyone has not accepted you into their hearts, just accept right now and say, dear Lord, I'm a sinner. Forgive me on my sins. For I want to accept you and make you Lord of my life. I know you died on the cross for me. I want to accept you, and I want to honor you. In Jesus' name. And dear Lord, forgive us, Lord God. This week, maybe we've said unkind words. Maybe we've been angry. Maybe we've said some stupid things. But Father, help us, Lord, to be better in our speech. Help us to think before we talk. Help us to slow down and realize to build people up versus tearing them down. Father, help me to be more encouraging, God. Help me to be more loving, God. And Father, help us, God, to honor you with our words. Because we want to speak the truth in love. We want people to know your hope and your grace and your peace. And to be coming into your kingdom, God. And Father, help us to use our words this week to tell people. To invite them into knowing you, God. For you are Lord alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Miss Irma is going to close us in a song. If you're able, please rise. Oh, God, let us be 
a generation that sees Seeks in your face, oh God of Jacob We bow our hearts We bow our hearts We bend our knees Oh, Spirit, come make us humble this week, God, in a powerful way. We ask for healing. We ask for strength. We ask that you heal us physically, financially, and spiritually, God, and emotionally, God. Father, we need you. We love you, and we thank you for today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Go out and spread words of encouragement. Amen. amen. Grief share will start in about 10 minutes downstairs. Thank you.